It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, welcome back. I want to welcome back the Premier, uh, back to the office. It's great to see him back here at work and to have the uh, opportunity to finally ask him some questions, because Ontario families have a lot of concerns about the Ford government's cuts. I'd like to start with our schools. Over the summer, the Financial Accountability Officer confirmed that the government's education cuts will eliminate 10,000 teachers from the province. Does the Premier believe the quality of Ontario schools will improve with 10,000 fewer teachers? Questions addressed to the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to welcome the Leader of the Opposition back in the House here. And I, I want to congratulate our all-star Minister of Education, the way you've been handling this file. Mr. Speaker, our government has invested over $700 million back into the classroom. That's more money than any government in the history of Ontario. We've announced a four-year, $200 million math strategy because we know 50% of our grade six students are failing math, Mr. Speaker, and one-third of those teachers that are teaching that math course also failed that math test. We are taking cell phones out of the classroom, Mr. Speaker. We're making financial literacy a key part of our math curriculum and a major component of the new grade 10 careers course so students know how to budget after they leave school. We're creating a new math curriculum Response. for grades 1 to 8, which will be ready in the next school year. We are more than doubling mental health funding in schools and supporting 180 permanent mental health support staff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I would suggest that if you want a world-class education system, you don't get there by firing the people who deliver it, who provide it, or frankly by forcing students into larger classrooms and stripping them of course options. The Premier has had five months to think about it, Speaker. Is he now ready to admit that his plan to eliminate 10,000 teachers and thousands more educational workers is going to hurt kids in the classroom? Premier. Uh, Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. I, I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for the question and just express, if I may, on behalf of um, my family, just the great humility it is to rise in this House as Minister of Education, having carriage for two million young people in the province. Um, Mr. Speaker, it is the aim of this minister and this government to ensure we to ensure every young person in this province is able to achieve their potential. We are doing that, as the Premier has acknowledged, through increasing public expenditure, the highest level ever recorded in provincial history. We're doing this, Madam Speaker, by ensuring we have the highest expenditure ever recorded in special education, in transportation, in First Nation education. Madam Speaker, we have doubled, more than doubled the mental health envelope. Student success and their well-being is the central focus, as is keeping children in the class through the labour negotiations. We will continue to focus on the success of our kids so that they, Response. Madam Speaker, can achieve their potential. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, after months of insisting that reckless cuts wouldn't hurt kids in the classroom, the Premier can no longer deny reality. 10,000 teachers' jobs are going to vanish in our province. Schools already are losing youth counsellors, social workers, speech-language pathologists, and other educational workers and supports. Course options have disappeared, as I've already said, so fast that some students aren't even sure that they're going to be able to graduate on time in this school year. And a few weeks ago, parents spent a nervous weekend not knowing if schools would actually be opening their doors on Monday morning. Why is the Premier still Still insisting, and this minister still insisting, that the budget cuts aren't impacting kids in the classroom when we all know they, in fact, are. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. It is, we know that parents deserve predictability and peace of mind over the coming year. It is why, Mr. Speaker, we've undertaken to negotiate in good faith with all of our union partners. It is why, Mr. Speaker, we were able to, through a voluntary agreement, while it is tentative, reach a deal with QP to keep children in the classrooms of this province. Mr. Speaker, it is the aim of this government to ensure that children are able to succeed, are able to achieve their potential, are able to get access to good careers in high-wage industries. That is why, Mr. Speaker, we've increased expenditure and investment in our children. 
It's why we're renewing our schools for over a half billion dollar investment to get new schools built and renew the existing ones. It's why we're updating our curriculum to uh, have greater alignment with labour market needs. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to support positive mental health and a, and a progressive uh, physical health <coughs> curriculum that ensures the safety Response. of our kids today and well into the future. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, for the Premier. You know, the Premier spent uh, most of the past five months either hiding or in damage control. Last year, uh, this Premier insisted that not a single person in our province would lose their job and that our schools, hospitals and public services would improve as he made cuts. Today, we're joined by Natalie and Brittany, both teachers who've lost their jobs. Is the Premier ready to admit that these women and the students that have lost the support that these teachers provided, that his reckless cuts had consequences? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite. What the Financial Accountability Officer did say is that the Teacher Protection Fund, the $1.6 billion allocation announced in the last budget to ensure frontline teachers remain in the front lines, is in fact working. In fact, he said that the fund is oversubscribed, that there's more monies needed to ensure the retention of those teachers in the front line. Mr. Speaker, we are investing $24 billion in school boards to ensure that they could do best in their localities to help young people succeed, to help them graduate and get a good paying job. We are not going to be deterred from that mission on focusing on the success of our kids, focusing on the success of our young people as they go through the journey of learning so that they can one day get access to a good paying job. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's obvious that the Teacher Protection Fund is not working because I just talked about Brittany and Natalie, who are teachers that have lost their jobs here in Ontario. The Ford government has scrambled this week to undo the political damage caused by their reckless cuts, but for families hit hard by cuts to their schools, weights in their hospitals or loss of public services, repackaging the same cuts on a different timeline doesn't make them any more acceptable or less painful. Can the Premier explain to families why he's ploughing ahead with an agenda of cuts, or will he finally admit that all of these cuts have serious consequences? Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, to be clear, our objective to the labour negotiations is to ensure that the students of this province remain in class. That is the singular priority of this Premier. He has made clear he wants children's education not to be interrupted. He wants them to continue to be able to learn the competencies needed in a competitive global marketplace. That is why we undertook an ambitious plan to negotiate in good faith early with CUPE in an expedited fashion, and we so far have received a tentative agreement with CUPE that has helped ensure we achieve that objective by keeping kids in class. With respect to uh, other Labour partners, on behalf of millions of working families, it is, my focus is on our students and not on strikes. Let's ensure we, we never compromise the success of our students, and I want a deal with our teachers. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And you back to the Premier on the general uh, you know, issue of the cuts. For five long months, the Ford government has tried to rebrand and repackage their agenda of cuts. The Premier threw his former finance and education ministers under the bus. He fired his former chief of staff. He even tried shutting down the legislature and hiding from reporters. But none of those uh, changes hide the actual facts, Speaker. Students in our schools are losing teachers and educational workers who are supportive of their learning. Patients in our hospitals are watching nurses uh, lose their jobs as beds continue to close and wait times continue to grow. Those are the things that the Premier needs to change, Speaker. Those are the changes that the people of Ontario need to see, not the changes that he's made over the last little while. When are those changes going to happen, Speaker? Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. In fact, if I may, I just want to correct the record, Madam Speaker. In the areas of education, health care alone, in education, we are spending over a billion, over seven hundred million dollars more this year than at the height of Liberal spending in 2017-18. Madam Speaker, in health care. In health care, it is the, under, the deputy, under the Deputy Premier's leadership that we are investing more than $1.3 billion more than the year prior to help remediate the issue of hallway health care. 
Mr. Speaker, we are doing all this without raising taxes, while growing the economy, so that we are able to sustain the social services that are so consequential to the next generation of workers, innovators, and, and patients in the province of Ontario. We're going to continue on our plan to grow the economy, invest in the services that families depend on, because that's what the families of this province have asked us to do. Well the next question. Once again, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Uh, last year, in response to questions about the Ford government's $30 million partisan campaign against putting a price on carbon pollution, the Premier said he would stop wasting public money and resources if the federal Conservatives lost. Because, to quote him, once the people decide, I respect democracy. Last week, despite these promises, the Premier insisted that he would proceed. My question is why? Questions to the Premier. Uh, th thank you for the, the question. Through you, Mr. Speaker, we ran on making life more affordable for the people of Ontario. We ran on making sure we're competitive when it comes to businesses when we're competing around the world. We didn't run on increasing gas prices by 35 cents a litre. It's unaffordable. We didn't run on making, making the carbon tax will cost families another $700 more a year. They just can't afford it. We have a great plan. We have a great environment plan. We're going to hit the Paris uh, Accord targets at 30 percent. We're already at 20, 22 and a half percent with 10 years to go. We're leading the country in emission reductions, Mr. Speaker. We have a great plan, but that plan does not include taxing the people Response. of Ontario, taxing businesses, making sure that the, we are competitive when it comes to businesses, and that's why our policies created 272,000 new jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the Premier might claim he has targets, but nobody's going to know if he hits them or not because he fired the Environmental Commissioner, yeah, Speaker. Right. <laughs> Look, the Premier said that he would respect democracy, and democracy was pretty clear, Speaker. More than two out of three Ontarians rejected Doug Ford, the Doug Ford government and their climate change uh, denial. They said no to diverting $30 million from schools, hospitals, etc., to pay for lawyers and advertisements. They said no to threatening gas stations with $10,000 fines if they refuse to put partisan stickers on the gas pumps that don't stick. Will the Premier <laughs> abandon this obscene waste of public money, show some respect for democracy and our planet, Speaker, and work on a plan to actually tackle the climate, climate crisis instead of ignore it. Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition was wondering what we were doing for the, the last few months. Well, I'll tell you what we've been doing in the last few months. We secured a historic transit plan that we put forward as a historic deal with the federal government with the City of Toronto and the provincial government. Yeah, yeah. Uh, called the Ontario Line, Mr. Speaker. Our Minister of Education re reached a deal with QP, a historic, historic deal to keep the kids in the classroom. We invested $116 million into the rural road and bridge projects through our Minister of Transportation and our Infrastructure <laughs> Minister, including widening Highway 3 in Essex. Can't wait to get to Essex. Ontario created 81 Ontario created 81,000 new jobs just Response. since June. 272,000 new jobs in the private sector because of the great policies this government has put forward and we're making new investments to fight against gun. Thank you. Thank you. The Premier will please take his seat. The Premier will please take his seat. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, the recently completed federal election was amongst the most divisive in our country's history, and it has resulted in a minority parliament. At a time of so much uncertainty in the global economy and with our nation increasingly divided, can the Premier please provide us with his thoughts on this past election? Questions to the Premier. I want to thank our all-star MPP from Willowdale. 
I first, I first want to congratulate all the candidates, no matter what political stripe they come from, uh, that they ran. They put their name in the hat. No matter if you won or you lost, congratulations. I called, I called the Prime Minister and offered my congratulations to the Prime Minister and told him, I understand politics. Let's get down to work now. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're going to work with the federal government. We're working with municipalities right across this province. <laughs> you know something, Mr. Speaker? That is why, at this critical time, I think it's important for Ontario to step up. Step up, unite the country. I've never seen the country so divided. Had a great visit with uh, Premier Blaine Higgs yesterday here in Ontario. We had Scott Moe on the phone. I talked to Francis Legault. What a great Premier for Response. Quebec. I talked to Jason Kenney. We all feel the same way. We need to unite this country because what is good for Canada is good for Ontario. And what is good for Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. Order. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker. I think everybody in this House agrees that uniting the country is very, very important. Premier, Ontario. Through you, Mr. Speaker, Ontario has been looked upon to provide leadership and stability and has always been a nation builder within the Federation. A minority parliament can present many challenges that can put priorities like ending hallway health care, infrastructure, and job creation through economic growth at risk. Through you, Mr. Speaker, does the Premier have a plan to protect Ontario and to help build a stronger Canada despite the uncertainty in Ottawa? Premier. Thank you, the MPP from Milledale for the question. As you know, the Minister of Health, the all-star Minister of Health, Deputy Premier, will assume the chairmanship of the Council of Health Ministers in the very near future, and the minister has already indicated that she will work across party lines to provide leadership despite regional differences. Mr. Speaker, additionally, the minister and associate minister of transportation have concluded a groundbreaking agreement to expand transit right across the GTA, no longer just Toronto, but right across GTA, and we have already secured the support of the federal government for this initiative. We thank the federal government. Finally, the Minister of Infrastructure has helped to nominate over 351 infrastructure projects right across this province to help the economy enhance our relationship with our municipal partners. We have, we have the responsibility, Mr. Speaker, to build a stronger, more prosperous Ontario and can only do that with a strong, unified Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Families in Ottawa need to know that an ambulance will be there for them when they have an emergency. But amazingly, under this government, people can't count on that. During 1J in June, Speaker, Ottawa paramedics declared level zero. That means they had no one available to transport patients, and that lasted for seven and a half hours. All those paramedics are telling us that this is becoming routine. In a radio interview last week, Speaker, this Premier blamed that situation on municipalities for the crisis. Does the Premier understand? that his underfunding of the health care system plays a huge role in this mess. And if he understands that, what is he prepared to do about it? And I might suggest, Speaker, a 14 per cent raise to this minister's high top officials is an insult to those paramedics that are trying to help families in Ottawa. Questions to the Premier. Uh, minister of Health. Referred to the Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much for the question, but I think we need to start off with what's actually helping ha happening in our health care system. We are actually increasing funding by $1.3 billion more this year from last year. So we are building on the uh, uh, 
accomplishments that have happened in the past. We're working on the future. As you know, emergency services are going to increase as they have last year. That funding is going to continue. We're going to invest in the technology so that we can have faster dispatch. And we've also engaged Mr. Jim Pine, who is well respected in municipal circles, to work with municipalities to talk about how we bring forward the rest of the plan, both for public health as well as emergency services. So we are continuing to build a strong brand. We want to make sure that every part of Ontario has quick acting services that we want to make sure that they have the Response. technology and the tools that they need in order to do their jobs. The supplementary member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Back to the Premier. Welcome back, Premier. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that the Premier understands that this is not just an Ottawa crisis. Uh, for three and a half hours on October 20th, the City of Hamilton had zero ambulances available to respond to an emergency call. Zero ambulances. Our ambulances were all stuck waiting at overcrowded hospitals. So and this crisis is only expected to get worse when the flu season hits. So when is the Premier going to admit that cutting hospital budgets are putting people's lives at risk? Minister. Once again, I have indicated that we are increasing health funding by $1.3 billion from the last year to this year. We've actually provided hospitals with more funding. They received a 2 percent increase this year, $384 million more in funding. And we have also provided some small and medium-sized hospitals that were underfunded because of the previous government's actions and the funding formula with one and one and a half percent increases in small and medium-sized hospitals. We recognize that there are some issues with respect to offloads in hospitals. We are pre preparing a, a course of action with having uh, hospital emergency room nurses being able to take over from those loads so that ambulances can be back out on the road. We have started that plan, but there's more work to do. But that is going to take a significant Response. load off of police services so they can be back out on the road doing the work they're doing and the ambulances can be back out on the road doing the work they're supposed to do. So the work is continuing and we thank you very much. The next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Uh, but first, I want to congratulate him on uh, his new position, an excellent choice given his experience and uh, credentials, and uh, I look forward uh, to working with him. Alors, Monsieur le Président, comme j'ai dit, ma Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, my question is to the Minister of Finance. I was in Winnipeg Friday for the uh, Francophone School Board convention that brings together school boards from throughout Canada. And despite the nature of that uh, convention, which is education, there was a question about wh when a French language commissioner would be returned, would uh, have his position returned, that would be independent. Mr. Mr. Speaker, to the, uh, the Minister of Transportation and Francophone Affairs. Refer to the Minister of Francophone Affairs. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for her question. As she knows, and as members in this uh, Legislative Assembly knows, uh, the Ontario Ombudsman is independent of the government and of uh, political parties. And the French Language Commissioner, his position was transferred completely under the purview of the Ombudsman. That means that all of his responsibilities, all of his duties, all of the work that he was doing, he will continue to do so within the office of the Ombudsman that is, remains completely independent from the government and of all political parties. And that's the definition of independence, it being independent from the government and political parties. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So what were the savings? Because if it's the same work that's being done and the justification from the government was that it was for savings, so what were the savings? It took a year for the government to add French to their signs that they were using. So how long will it take before we have an answer in terms of how much was saved by transferring the position of the commissioner under the ombudsman? 
if that question is so simple, can they tell us uh, how long uh, how much was saved or are they hiding something? The Ombudsman, Paul Dubé, confirmed that uh, the Commissioner will have the same mandate and the same resources to promote linguistic rights and to identify the problems that the Francophone community is faced with. I would ask all members in this House to promote the fact that the Commissioner will remain and then we'll continue to have a team that is specialized in the protection and promotion of uh, French, the French language. So the Ombudsman is looking for a new commissioner and will, provide, will allow the commissioner enough time to do his work. The member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Last week, the City of Toronto Executive Committee endorsed the province's subway plan, and I understand that City Council is discussing the plan this week. Minister, there has been a great deal of debate on the plan, and in particular the merits of the proposed Ontario line. As you know, commuters struggle, including those in my riding, struggle with overcrowding across TTC lines one and two, and the Ontario line needs to provide relief from overcrowding giving us the capacity to allow for new investments in the GTA. Can the minister please advise the House of some of the benefits of the Ontario line? Questions to the Minister of Transportation. Well, I'd like to thank the member from Eglinton Lawrence for her question. This has been a historic month for transit in Ontario because for the first time in many years, we have a consensus on what subways to build. The Ontario Line is the centerpiece of our government's gridlock-busting network of new subway projects. The line itself is twice as long as the line that was previously considered, and it will bring rapid transit to communities like Thorncliffe Park and Flemington Park. These bringing new opportunities to those residents in those neighbourhoods while reducing pressures on the existing network. Mr. Speaker, we need the Ontario line. The people of Thorncliffe Park and Flemington Park need it, and I'd urge everyone in this House to support it. Here, here. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, residents in my riding are excited about the government's plan to build four new subway lines across the city, and I'm glad to learn that the additional subway capacity will reduce the gridlock and relieve pressure on the existing subway lines. But building subways is not easy. Can the minister please advise the House about what will be required to get the Ontario line built? Minister. Thank you again to, uh, to the member for the question, and she's right. Building subways is not easy, but for the first time in a very, very long time, we have a consensus that this is the right plan. We have the endorsement of the mayor, the federal government, and four of the five federal parties. That agreement is a testament to the fact that all the parties are committed to doing the right thing for commuters and getting these much-needed lines built. But we still need two things, Mr. Speaker. We need City Council to join the Mayor, the federal government and ourselves as partners in this project, and we need the federal government to commit to 40 per cent federal funding. I will be working with the Premier and reaching out to both City Council and federal members of Parliament to secure the investment we need to get shovels in the ground. And I would urge all members of this House Response. to contact their newly elected members of parliament and ask them to back these lines and the 40% funding formula. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Welcome back, Premier. While the government was on vacation, high school students in this province were facing absolutely impossible decisions as they saw their course options disappear and their class sizes balloon. As a result of this government's education cuts, students risk not being able to even get the courses they need to graduate. 
Last week, the Education Minister tried to put a new spin on a bad idea, but his proposal includes a poison pill that could see class size caps removed entirely. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier tell us today if he really intends to put the safety of our kids at risk by removing class size caps? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Education. Heard to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the member opposite my critic. I appreciated very much meeting with her over the summer to discuss these very matters. Madam Speaker, indeed, last week the government demonstrated yet again our commitment to being a constructive force at the tables to land deals, to keep kids in the class. That has been the priority of this government. It's been the direction of our Premier to ensure that children's education is never impeded or never compromised. That is why, Mr. Speaker, that was the driving force behind us landing the deal with CUPE, the voluntary agreement with CUPE that remains under ratification. It is why last week, as the member mentioned, we reduced the classroom size number from 28 of the provincialized average down to 25. Mr. Speaker, that is because we want students in the class to remain in the class all year long. We are committed to this end, and again, my message to our Labour partners Response. on behalf of so many students is to focus on our students and not on strikes. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Premier. I, I'm going to take that as a no. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Speaker, it may be Halloween this week, but hocus pocus and half measures aren't going to hide the fact that kids went back to school this fall with fewer teachers, overcrowded classrooms, and chaos in their schools. Doing away with class size caps is absolutely reckless. It's a decision that's going to make matters even worse, and it's going to hit our most vulnerable students. Will you commit to finally doing the right thing, abandon these changes, and stop making our kids pay the price for your government's failures? Once again, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and through you to the member. I mean, Mr. Speaker, we have, through this process, been a constructive force, a reasonable force, with a singular objective in mind, and that is to ensure we land deals, voluntary agreements that keep kids in class. Mr. Speaker, that is why last week we proposed to OSSTF, one of the unions, an offer, not the final offer, but an offer through the ebb and flow of this process, because we made a commitment to parents. And I want them to know and hear us loud and clear that every member of this caucus is committed to ensuring their child's education is never compromised, to ensure they have a world class, access to a world-class education system in a province as diverse and free in, the, in Canada. Mr. Speaker, we lowered the number from 28 of the provincial average to 25. We hope that that will incentivize our partners to stay at the table and to land a deal with this government. The next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. The lack of movement on building better public transit has shortchanged my constituents of Scarborough Agent Court and more broadly commuters across the Scarborough and Southern York region for decades. Earlier this year, the Premier unveiled our government's historic multi-billion dollar plan to get subway built across the GTA. Residents in Scarborough and Southern New York are cautiously optimist that we are finally moving forward with a three-stop subway extension in Scarborough as one of our government's four priority subway projects. Could the Associate Minister explain why this three-stop subway extension is the right plan for Scarborough. Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. Thank you very much to the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, the people of Scarborough deserve to, to have the same public transit access as the people of downtown. Mr. Speaker, I know that Minister, the Minister of Transportation has had several discussions with, our par with her parliamentary assistant, the member for Scarborough Rouge Park, about how this will benefit the people of Scarborough. But let me be very clear, Mr. Speaker, it's three stations. The people of Scarborough deserve to be able to walk to a station so that they can get on the subway and get to downtown and home. Mr. Speaker, one stop subway is not enough for the people of Scarborough. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, Scarborough and Markham's commuters have waited too long for increased access to public transportation. It's reassuring to know that our government recognizes this and has deemed the Scarborough subway extension a priority project. Could the Associate Minister explain what our next steps are in getting this three-stop extension built? Associate Minister of Transportation, Chief. Thank you very 
very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. What is very clear is that the people of Scarborough have been waiting for far too long, Mr. Speaker. We know that there is a very important City Council vote this week. Uh, the Minister and I are very optimistic. We are encouraging all City Councillors to support our plan and, of course, the federal government to make their contribution of 40%. Uh, but I want to encourage all members of this House to support our transit plan. Mr. Speaker, it's time to get shovels in the ground. Next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Before the election, the Premier promised that he would lower hydro rates by 12 per cent. Last week, the Ontario Energy Board published the new hydro rates for household consumers. Turns out that typical hydro rates are going up by $24 a year. Premier, why are hydro bills going up? under your government instead of coming down. Hmm. The Premier, Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Boy, we sure inherited a, a mess, Mr. Speaker, an unmitigated disaster. Oh, and we took order. important steps immediately over the past year and a half, Mr. Speaker, to reduce uh, costs system-wide, Mr. Speaker, to introduce legislation and repeal some, Mr. Speaker, that would guarantee that we would get to a place in the not-too-distant future where we could actually cut costs, not subsidize them, not move them into uh, uh, and saddle ratepayers and taxpayers with further debt. Mr. Speaker, we have taken these important steps so that we can now move forward with industrial, small business, families, Mr. Speaker, across the province to a cut model, Mr. Speaker, that will see those costs reduced after the terrible legacy uh, of the now independent Liberal group, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. I, I don't think in the Premier's plan he was talking about a 100-year approach to this yeah. issue, but, sure. but I now understand. Um, the time of use rates posted by the Ontario Energy Board now reflect the actual cost of hydro. They show that the actual cost of hydro have risen by roughly 15 per cent over the past three years. The Premier's promise to lower hydro bills by 12 per cent is getting further and further out of reach. As hydro rates go up on November 1st, not down. Premier, the people of Ontario are tired of stretch goals and unfulfilled promises. Why is this government not only failing to lower hydro bills, but actually letting bills get higher? The minister. Well, let, let's 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 look at, let's take a look at this track record, Mr. Speaker. From 10, 2010 to 2008, the price of electricity doubled under the previous Liberal government. That's why we passed Bill 87, fixing the Hydro Mass Act, Mr. Speaker. We repealed the Green Energy Act. We consolidate our conservation programs to protect Ontario's most vulnerable people and saving the ratepayers $442 million. We're expanding natural gas so that across the province, families are in fact. It, uh, experiencing an overall reduction in their energy costs, Mr. Speaker. Now, what do those steps have in common? Two things. They are putting us in a position, Mr. Speaker, to move towards cutting rates, not subsidizing, and the NDP voted against every single one of those. The next question, the member for Flamborough, Landbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that the long-term care system is still overburdened, and although the previous government made little progress on the file over 15 years, Ontario families wow. don't care who's to blame. They want results. Yep. Similarly, emergency services and hospitals are looking to the long-term care sector to alleviate hallway health care by creating capacity for more appropriate care in long-term care homes. Mr. Speaker, what progress has the minister made in addressing the crisis across Ontario and, more specifically, in my region? The Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. The member from Th Flamborough Glenbrook is correct. Ontario families want to see progress. A lack of focus by the previous government, along with limited resources as a result of out-of-control spending by the previous government, left Ontario families in a challenging situation when attempting to secure a long-term care bed. And recently, we announced a new allocation of almost 1,000 new long-term care beds and upgrading almost 800 existing beds to modern design standard 
in Haldeman, Norfolk, Brant, Hamilton, and Niagara. Of these, Shalom Manor has been allocated 128 beds for its new build project in Hamilton. So I'm working with our partners and across Response. government, building a coordinated, integrated, long-term care system that delivers appropriate, dignified care when and where people need it. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Minister. Investing in additional long-term care is an important step to ending hallway health care and ensuring that patients are in the right place with the right supports. Can the minister tell us more about how the government is facilitating access to beds and how individuals are supported while they wait? Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, we are working across government to ensure that patients are at the centre of our health care system. The Ministry of Long-Term Care is making key investments towards furthering that goal, and they include investing $13 million to enable high-priority beds, investing in staff, creating excellent jobs in nursing and personal support work. And I'm working to keep spouses together, close to their families, and in their communities. And in just over a year, our government has made tremendous strides towards delivering on the quality of care our loved ones deserve. In total, we will be investing more than $1.7 billion over the next five years to build 15,000 new long-term care beds and redevelop an additional 15,000. We are hard at work. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Welcome back. My question is to the Premier. Welcome back, Premier. This government, Speaker, is once again making life worse for families with big cuts to childcare funding. Last week, the government suggested that families should be grateful that their cuts won't be as deep as promised. But the city of Peterborough is considering closing two child care centers and two after-school programs because of this government's cuts to municipalities. So my question is, should the children, should the 300 children in Peterborough that are at risk of losing their child care spaces and the 30 workers at risk of losing their job be grateful about these cuts? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Education. Refer to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Um, in fact, all families in Peterborough and across this province are benefiting from our government's historic investment in child care, a $2 billion allocation to help build 30,000 spaces, child care spaces, in schools right across this province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, every single family. Every single family is benefiting from our child care tax credit, where 300,000 people will see their child care prices come down by, through a tax credit that provides up to 75% of eligible expenses. Mr. Speaker, this is a mobile tax credit. It's, not, it's an admission that families need to have the mobility to move their dollars where it matters most for their kids. We do not support a one-size-fits-all approach to child care. We want to give families the opportunity to invest in their children with a child care program that works best for their kids. The supplementary question. Back to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, these cuts are going to hurt families no matter which way the minister tries to spin it. Peterborough is already considering cutting child care centres and programs. And the City of Toronto, right here, is uh, $5 million short for this year alone, with deeper cuts coming next year. Given that a cut is a cut is a cut, and a slow and painful rip off the Band-Aid isn't going to make things better, especially when you're going out of your way to make things worse next year. Will this Premier commit finally to doing the right thing and reverse these cuts? Families deserve better, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and to the member, I want to just reaffirm, it is this government that is investing over $2 billion to ensure child care is both accessible and affordable for working parents in the province of Ontario. It is this government, under the leadership of the Premier, who is investing over nearly $400 million in tax relief to, for families because we acknowledge, Mr. Speaker, that under the former government, quite demonstrably, child care rose to the highest in the nation juxtaposed, Mr. Speaker, with the slowest rate of income growth. So we acknowledge that families are working harder and taking home less. That is why we're focused on affordability. So moms and dads across this province has access to a child care tax credit that allows them to choose child care options in Peterborough and in communities right across Ontario because they deserve that choice and they deserve that money, Mr. Speaker. 
Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, welcome back. Question for the Minister of Long Term Care. The uh, previous government allowed the wait list for long term care to grow to an unsustainable level, leaving over 36,000 people waiting for care yeah. and their families struggling to make ends meet. Shame. Minister, this past September, you announced the allocation of new beds in several Ontario communities with plans for further allocations. Can you please update this House of the progress in both allocating beds and reducing the wait list for seniors and for their families across the province? Questions to the Minister of Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Haldeman Norfolk. Our government recognizes the vital service that long term care provides Ontarians, which is why we created a dedicated ministry to long term care. We also recognize the stresses on the system from 15 years of neglect and that the need for long term care capacity in Ontario is only rising. That's why we're taking real action to address those concerns. And over the next five years, we are investing $1.75 billion to improve access to long-term care beds and the long-term care system. An additional 15,000 new beds will be created, and we will be renovating an additional 15,000 beds to modern design standards. This year alone, we have allocated over 1,800 new beds and Response. reaffirmed our commitment towards building over 6,000 previously allocated beds. Mr. Speaker, we're making real progress that will benefit generations to come. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you again. Thank you again, Speaker. Communities across the province will benefit from these investments. Families want to have their loved ones cared for in the right environment. At the same time, building more beds, redeveloping older beds will help alleviate pressures on our hospital system as we work to uh, end hallway health care. Minister, along with the allocations you spoke about, what further actions is the government taking to build more capacity in our long-term care system? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the member for his very good work. Earlier this month, our government announced plans to start accepting applications from current and potential long-term care home operators to build new long-term care beds and redevelop existing ones here in Ontario. This call for applications will help fulfil our commitment to create 15,000 new long-term care beds and bring up to standard another 15,000 beds over the next five years. With an ageing population, these new and redeveloped beds will help more families and residents get the care that they need and the support that they need when they need it. We need to create a 21st century long-term care system that ensures Ontarians get the care they need when they need it. The Premier has made this a priority of our government, and the Response. people of Ontario are demanding results. We will continue to focus on respecting those who have worked so hard to give us the province we now enjoy. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Enrico Miranda was a 57-year-old father and grandfather killed last month as he was cleaning an industrial mixer at Fair Foods in North York. Despite having worked at Fair for over five years, Mr. Miranda was still a temp agency employee. The WSIB Act gives the government the ability to regulate temp agencies and to ensure temp workers have the same protection as other workers in the province of Ontario. But after a year in office, the Ford government has refused to do so. My question is clear. Why? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank uh, the member opposite for this very important question. On behalf of uh, the government, on behalf of all MPPs in the Legislature, we extend our condolences, our sincere uh, sympathies to uh, uh, the family. Uh, clearly, one lost life uh, is too many. I've said since becoming the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development that one injury on the job, uh, one death is one too many uh, in the province of Ontario. 
Uh, it is in inappropriate, as all members know, to uh, discuss uh, the ongoing investigation uh, by the Ministry of uh, Labour, but I want to make it uh, uh, quite clear that uh, we are uh, doing 1,500 Ministry of Labour inspections uh, every single week in the province of Ontario. That's nearly uh, 80,000 inspections uh, per year. And Mr. Response. Speaker, I want all of those uh, businesses who aren't complying by the rules to know that there's going to be a Ministry of Labour inspector at their door. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, my question has absolutely nothing to do with the investigation. Mr. Miranda was the fifth, the fifth temp agency worker killed at Fair Foods, the second since the Conservatives formed government. And this is important, and please listen. He was cleaning the machine that day because he had already been badly injured his finger elsewhere in the plant and had been pressured to stay on the job. Nothing about this situation doesn't stink, and yet this Conservative government has been silent since his death. When is this government going to take action to ensure, to ensure temp workers have this protection to ensure they don't die on the job? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, to uh, the member opposite again, uh, thank you uh, for that question. Uh, our uh, uh, thoughts and prayers are with uh, the family uh, impacted, with uh, his colleagues and with his co-workers. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, uh, in our ministry, uh, we're doing 1,500 uh, inspections uh, every week. Uh, regarding this specific uh, case, Mr. Speaker, as the member opposite knows, uh, we can't comment as the investigation uh, is ongoing. But I want to make it uh, crystal clear to the member opposite, to all members uh, in this House, that we can and will do more, and I'm committed uh, to action on this particular file and all files across the province to improve uh, health and safety for the conditions of our workers everywhere in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Minister, I know I speak for all members on this side of the House when I say that all levels of government have an important role to play when it comes to investing in infrastructure. Municipalities, the province, and the federal government must work together to ensure our constituents have a safe and reliable roads and bridges and infrastructure, transit infrastructure. This summer, I had the pleasure of sharing details of our government's infrastructure investments with my constituents. I'm delighted that our government is investing in County Road 2 in Morrisburg and the upgrades to LeMay Street in Cornwall. These investments are important to ensuring my constituents have safe and reliable roads when they travel to and from work and home. I'm also delighted that the government is making important investments in transit infrastructure to the city of Cornwall, allowing them to purchase conventional buses and handy transit buses. Can the minister tell the House if this province will continue these important investments? Questions to the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Stormont, Dundas and South Glengarry for the question. Our government is continuing to work with municipalities, families and businesses to make smart investments in our infrastructure and keep it reliable for the people of Ontario. To date, Ontario has nominated 144 road, bridge, air and marine infrastructure projects across the province under the rural and northern funding stream with a total provincial investment of more than $115 million. If all rural and northern projects nominated to date by myself and my predecessor are approved approved by the federal government, the total federal, provincial and municipal spend could reach up to $592 million for Ontario communities. But that's not all of the investments we're making. Ontario is investing in 201 transit infrastructure projects in 53 communities outside the GTHA with a total Bons. provincial commitment of $365 million. We're investing in communities like Cornwall. Transit projects we've announced promise to make a real difference in people's lives. And yes, Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to make those infrastructure yeah, yeah. investments. A supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for reassuring the House that our government recognizes the importance of infrastructure investments to the people of Ontario. 
Minister, while investments in roads and bridges are important in rural and northern Ontario, some of our mid-sized and larger municipalities need investments in transit, transit infrastructure to assure their continued economic growth, as well as improvements to the quality of life for residents. I know the minister has visited London and Waterloo Region to announce transit infrastructure investments in those two communities, and of course I mentioned the important investments in Cornwall in my earlier question. Minister, the investments in transit are also important in other communities throughout eastern Ontario, and I understand the city of Kingston brought forward some priority transit projects for federal and provincial funding. Some of those investments include enhancements to accessibility and an enhanced pathways and Question. connectivity for pedestrians and cyclists. Can the minister elaborate on these important transit investments for the people of Kingston? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm pleased to let the member and, in fact, the whole House know that our government is making important infrastructure investments, uh, including transit infrastructure in communities across the province. And, in fact, if all transit projects outside the GTHA that Ontario has nominated for funding through the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program are approved, the total federal, provincial, and municipal investment could reach up to $1.15 billion for communities across Ontario. Ontario, Mr. Speaker. In Kingston, provincial investments include construction of off-road trails and sidewalks, pedestrian crossovers and intersection pedestrian signals to provide improved passenger connectivity to 22 bus routes, including express routes. We are also investing in the construction of accessible transit stations, Response. the purchase of new buses and transit priority technology to be installed on 80 buses to provide passengers with real-time bus arrival information. Ontario is investing over $14 million in provincial funding to improve public transit in the city of Kingston, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, member for Meshkigawak, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, to the Premier. The Francophone community needs a French Language Services Act that is current and that meets its needs. The Minister has done nothing to change or amend the Act. In fact, she announced that uh, there are discussions that are taking place with the community, but she refuses to identify the participants or any dates involved. Mr. Speaker, why is she having meetings behind closed doors and why is she not committing to modernize the Act? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question and for the opportunity to um, clarify what's been said because I clearly said that we will be modernize the Act on French language services in the province of Ontario for the first time in many decades because, Mr. Speaker, our government understands that access to French language services is a fundamental issue for the community. And it's for that reason that we can't do things too quickly. We have to take it seriously, and that's why I'm working with the, the Advisory Council in order to implement the right plan following consultations that are open to all Francophones and to all Ontarians that want to participate in this consultation. Mr. Speaker, I think that the member will be very pleased to hear that we'll be working with all members that want to participate in the consultation in order to uh, modernize the Act. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the answer from the Minister. It's been over a year that she said she would modernize the Act, but we still don't have a modernized Act, and we don't know who she's consulting with. Next week, I'll be tabling a bill to modernize the Act on French language services. This is an act or a bill that is based on the recommendations from the fir former French language services commu commissioner, including a, an inclusive definition to respect uh, the Francophonie in the 21st century, an obligation to consult, and I'm putting the emphasis on consultation with the Francophone community, Franco-Ontarian community. 
and the re-establishment of the French Language Services Commissioner? Will the minister listen once and for all the demands from the Francophone community, and will she support this bill? As I mentioned, the government takes the recommendations very seriously and also all of the demands from the community in order to modernize the Act. We're looking at how we can modernize the Act to ensure that it reflects the needs and the reality of uh, Franco-Ontarians. I asked the panel, the consultation panel, to take all the time necessary to reflect on all of the issues involved. As Minister responsible for Francophone Affairs, I'll be working with my colleagues and with the community in order to move this issue forward and to ensure that Franco-Ontarians are heard in this House. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Speaker, uh, earlier this August, I had the pleasure of being joined by Premier Ford uh, to announce important investments Ontario is making to road infrastructure in my riding of Niagara West. Good. Our investment of $1.67 million will, in will include full reconstruction of 2.5 kilometres of downtown Quant Hills Pelham Street, which includes new pedestrian sidewalks, on-road cycling lanes and new street lighting. These types of investments have a significant local impact on the economic development of Font Hill and West Niagara, and it will also enhance the safety and reliability of this roadway. Speaker, can the minister tell this House if Ontarians living in the Niagara region can look forward to more road uh, and transit infrastructure investments like this in the future? Good for Niagara. The minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Niagara West for his important question in highlighting the investment that we have made in the Niagara region. Uh, as I said before, Mr. Speaker, uh, the province is investing more than $115 million to in, into 144 road, bridge, air and marine infrastructure projects um, coming from the ICIP uh, infrastructure program. Mr. Speaker, uh, we are investing in communities outside the GTHA, inside the GTHA, but the member is right. There's approximately $23.9 million in the region of Niagara for transit infrastructure projects in Welland. Ontario is investing $5 million for the construction of an operations facility to store 40 conventional and specialized buses and will allow for bus maintenance uh, and training space. And in St. Catharines, the province is investing $3.3 million in the expansion of a maintenance and bus Response. storage facility to, con uh, to accommodate their increasing demands. Niagara Falls will also see a $1.5 million investment for the construction. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And that concludes the time we have available for question period this morning. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Francophone Affairs concerning the French Language Services Commissioner, and this matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. There being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m. <laughs>